Uh, we're very glad to have Marin Chambers, who is a research associate at the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute at Colorado State University. Um, she's recently back to work uh, uh, after some maternity leave, and so we're very pleased that she was willing to schedule in this webinar. I know getting back into the, the swing of work is, uh, can be hectic, so uh, I appreciate her taking the time to do this. Her research interests include disturbance ecology, specifically the plant community and forest development under various disturbance types, which uh, sort of makes sense given today's topic. And much of what she'll be presenting in, in this webinar is work that she did as part of her master's research at Colorado State University uh, in the graduate degree program. And she worked in conjunction with the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Fort Collins. So without uh, further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to Marin here, uh, virtually at least. And uh, Marin, you should have controls and you have the floor. Great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Xander, and thank you to everyone attending for your time and your interest in this research. Um, Today, I will give a brief introduction regarding the concern for post-fire conifer regeneration following high-severity wildfires, and then I'll quickly discuss our study design and study areas, and then I'll be presenting our results and management implications for the Colorado Front Range, where we started this research in 2012, and then I'll discuss our preliminary results and management implications for the Southern Rockies region, where we collected data in 2015. So I know everybody's busy and possibly eating lunch. Um, so basically our main take home story for this work is that conifer regeneration is occurring in severely burned areas in the Southern Rockies um, following high severity wildfires. But regeneration densities are very low. Um, increased distance from sur surviving forest leads to decreased regeneration densities in high severity burn areas where we found that most regeneration is occurring within about 50 meters of forest edges and that other biotic and abiotic factors such as elevation on the Colorado Front Range and coarse woody debris on the Southern Rockies are influencing post-fire regeneration. So wildfire has long been known to be an important and complex ecological process in western dry conifer ecosystems. But in recent decades, wildfires have increased in their size, frequency, and severity. And this trend of more frequent fires and severe fire effects is thought to be the result of increased forest density and homogeneity due to fire suppression, livestock grazing, and, grazing and log, logging activities since European settlement. And this trend of increased frequency, size, and severity of wildfires that's occurring across the West is also occurring in ponderosa pine dominated forests of the Southern Rockies, which we define here as extending from the Black Hills of South Dakota and Wyoming through the Laramie Mountain Range of Wyoming and into the Front Range of Colorado. Um, within the Southern Rockies region, it's thought that Ponderosa Pine dominated forests historically followed two very general fire regimes. The first pattern is of high frequency, low to moderate severity fires, which are associated with lower elevations near grasslands. And the second pattern is of a mixed frequency and severity wildfire, which creates mosaics of low, moderate, and high severity burn patches. And this um, type of uh, pattern is often associated with higher elevations um, and mixed conifer forests, where ponderosa pine is co-dominant with other dry conifer species, such as Douglas fir. But some recent fires across the West have trended towards very large, high severity wildfires, which has created very large patches of complete stand-replacing burns where few existing seed sources survive. And while the historical fire pattern in Ponderosa pine-dominated forests did include high-severity burn patches, these stand-replacing patches are not thought to have been much larger than about 250 acres. Um, I should mention here that there is some debate about whether or not these large fires that have contigu large contiguous areas of complete stand-replacing burns are considered outside of their historical range of variability for this region. Um, see Williams and Baker 2012 in Ecosystems for an exception. But it's generally accepted that the recent trend of large high severity wildfires has not been seen in historical record for fires in this region. 
And the damage caused by some of these large high severity wildfires has been considerable and includes economic damage due to the destruction and infrastructure of homes, as well as ecological damage due to the loss of forest cover type across very large contiguous portions of the landscape. And this ecological damage raises uncertainty and concern for land managers and the public about the ability of Ponderosa pine dominated forests to reestablish within modern wildfire perimeters where high severity patches may differ from historical ones. Um, this concern stems from the fact that the life history traits of ponderosa pine present several challenges for this species regeneration following high severity wildfire. So while some forests quickly recover following wildfires, such as lodgepole pine, ponderosa pine is a non-serotonous, non-sprouting conifer, and its very large seeds are short-lived in the seed bank. Post-fire regeneration of ponderosa pine depends on seed production and dispersal from surviving trees, which is episodic and relies on specific climatic conditions. Additionally, ponderosa pine seeds are not thought to travel very far from parent seed sources, creating challenges for forest recovery in large high severity burn areas. Studies that have examined how far ponderosa pine seeds can travel or disperse from, from seed sources have found varying results. Some studies have found that ponderosa pine seeds fall in seed shadows, traveling as little as 30 meters from parent trees while other studies have found that seeds fill distances up to 200 meters from parent trees. But it's generally thought that ponderosa follows a trend of decreasing number of established seedlings as distance from parent seed sources increases and has relatively few long distance dispersal events. Thus, ponderosa pine seeds are well adapted to regenerate in low or mixed severity wildfires as opposed to very large high severity wildfires that result in vast expanses that lack in seed sources. <clears throat> Other biotic and abiotic factors are also likely influencing the ability of ponderosa pine to establish in severely burned areas. Several studies examining post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration have found that the majority of the standard placing burn areas had little or no tree regeneration, and that this lack of regeneration was found to be influenced by elevation, competition with understory vegetation, and aspect, where, for example, with aspect, regeneration on south-facing slopes might be limited due to harsher growing conditions as a result of the effects of solar radiation. And so for greater context for the concern regarding these fires, this is an aerial image of the 1996 Buffalo Creek Fire, which burned nearly 30,000 acres southwest of the Denver area. Um, the green areas that you see are reflecting forested areas in this imagery while the grayish brown areas are reflecting um, soil, which depict high severity burn areas. So as you can see in this image, large portion of this fire burned at high severity, resulting in huge patches of complete canopy mortality. And for an even more dramatic example, this image is from the Hayman Fire that burned nearly 130,000 acres in the Pike National Forest in 2002 an area of about 17 square miles burned in one day during high winds, creating a nearly 50,000 acre high severity burn patch. This enormous standard placing patch has been called highly unusual and unprecedented. And while this is an extreme example, and certainly not all burn patches are this large, I hope that these two examples illustrate the concern regarding the resiliency of these forests following high severity wildfire, and the potential for large patches of severely burned forests to naturally recover given that large ponderosa pine seeds are not thought to establish much farther than about 200 meters from surviving trees and have relatively few long distance dispersal events. Additionally, there's concern that the potential of the lack of regeneration in these large high severity burn areas may result in the conversion to another vegetation type such as the grassland or a shrubland. So our research aimed to address some of the patterns of conifer regeneration in high severity burn areas. We started to examine these patterns in the Colorado Front Range in 2014, and then we extended our study to the larger Southern Rockies region in 2015. Our research objectives were to quantify conifer regeneration in unburned, lightly to moderately burned, and severely burned areas, to investigate the degree to which distance from surviving trees influences regeneration in severely burned areas, and to investigate the role that other biotic and abiotic factors have in governing regeneration in severely burned areas. 
So each of the fires that we worked in were at least um, 2,500 acres and had large portions of high severity burn areas, were located in ponderosa pine dominated forests, and were at least 10 years old or older to allow regeneration events to occur. We avoided private properties and areas where post-fire salvage logging and restoration planting had occurred. And we collected data in 11 fires in the Southern Rockies region, in the Black Hills of South Dakota and Wyoming, in the Laramie Mountain Range, in the Medicine Bow National Forest in Wyoming, and in the Colorado Front Range. We chose our study areas within each fire by first utilizing monitoring trends in burn severity or MTBS maps to assess high severity burn areas. Um, sites needed to contain both surviving forests as well as high severity burn areas. And all high severity burn patches were required to be at least 900 feet wide, which typically resulted in patches that were at least two, 22 acres in size that had no surviving trees within these patches. But Generally, the patches that we sampled were much, much larger than 22 acres. So for the purpose of our study, high severity has been defined as 100% overstory mortality. However, um, monitoring trends in burn severity maps do not have the same definition for high severity burn areas. So we took great time and effort to identify any groups or individual surviving trees within high severity burn patches um, in both ArcGIS as well as in the field. And if any surviving groups or individual trees were identified, these patches were omitted as potential study areas. Once an edge and high severity um, burn area were identified, random points were generated in ArcGIS along surviving forest edge. And then at or near this random point, we established a transect, which we anchored at a tree along the surviving forest edge and then extended that um, transect 50 meters into the surviving forest, which let me try to grab my highlighter here just to um, illustrate this. So this is a low to moderate severity area. Um, and then the, the transect extended into the high severity burn patch um, 150 meters, but often up to 250 meters from the forest edge. When placing the transect within the high severity burn patch, we took great care to ensure that the distance along the transect equaled to, or was greater than the distance to the surviving forest which it originated. And then at each 25 or 50 meter increment along the transect, we established a 100 square meter circular plot where we collected data on all tree seedlings greater than or equal to 5 centimeters tall, as well as several abiotic and biotic microsite variables. We also collected data in control plots that were located outside of the fire perimeters, but were as close to our transect areas as possible. And so just to clarify, I'll first be presenting the result from my master's research, which I did on the Front Range of Colorado, as our results for the larger Southern Rockies region are still preliminary. This field work was completed in 2014, and we collected data in five fires in the montane zone of the Front Range of Colorado including the 2002 Cayman Fire, which was Colorado's largest known wildfire. All of this, the fires that we sampled in the Colorado Front Range were located predominantly in the Arapaho, Roosevelt, and Pike National Forests. And I, so, I should note here that most of my tables and figures are in metric units, but I've provided English units for key points. But um, if you're curious about metric units um, or any of the other tables or additional resources, those can all be referenced in Chambers et al. in Forest Ecology and Management, which details the results of our findings from our work here on the Front Range. So we ran analyses for three plot types, um, controlled or unburned plots that were located outside of our fire perimeters, but were located as close to transect areas as possible. Um, low to moderate severity burn plots, which were located within 50 meters of surviving forest edges in areas where fire had burned but did not result in 100% overstory mortality. And then um, high severity burn plots, which were located in areas where there was 100% overstory mortality. And we also examined three regeneration categories, all conifers, which include ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, blue spruce, Rocky Mountain juniper, and lodgepole pine. Um, ponderosa pine, which is the dominant species in the sampled forest on the Colorado Front Range. And Douglas fir, which is co-dominant with ponderosa pine on the Colorado Front Range, particularly at higher elevations and on north-facing slopes. 
Um, other conifer species, such as Rocky Mountain juniper, were not abundant enough to analyze individually. And we also found aspen present in some of our study sites, but it was also not abundant in, enough to analyze, um, to include any, any of our analyses. So in regard to our first research objective, um, whether conifers are regenerating in high severity burn areas, I want to first illustrate that the vast majority of the plots that we measured on the Colorado Front Range in high severity burn areas did not have any regeneration. So the bar graph to your left shows that in our unburned plots, 30% had no conifer regeneration, and 40% of our low to moderate severity burn plots had no regeneration. Whereas in high severity burn areas, 37, I'm sorry, excuse me, 75% of our plots had no conifer regeneration. We also performed an ANOVA analysis to determine the average number of seedlings per acre across all fires for each of the burn severity plot types that we sampled. You can see illustrated in the table, seedlings are regenerating in high severity burn areas, but at low densities in comparison to our low to moderate and unburned plots. In these higher densities of regenerating conifers in low to moderate severity burn areas and unburned areas, suggest that regeneration events have occurred in the 10 or more years since these fires burned, but severely burned areas have not experienced similar rates of post-fire conifer regeneration during this time period. For our second research objective regarding whether distance from live trees influences regeneration in high severity burn areas, we used a regression analysis to determine that distance does indeed influence regeneration in these standard placing patches, specifically for all conifers um, and for ponderosa pine. But this trend was not significant for Douglas fir. In the regression curve to the right, you can see that within about 50 meters of the forest edge, Conifer seedling density tends to be greater than about 50 meters, uh, I'm sorry, 50 stems per acre, but as distance increases 50 meters or more from the forest edge, seedling densities decrease, with very few seedlings regenerating 250 meters from live seed sources. Results from regression tree analyses also identified distance from surviving forest as the most significant predictor of conifer and ponderosa pine regeneration densities in high severity burn areas. At distances greater than or equal to 50 meters from surviving forest, predicted mean post-fire conifer and ponderosa pine regeneration densities were 20 and 14 stems per acre, respectively. And our findings of conifer and ponderosa pine densities that declined with in increased distance from live trees are consistent with findings from some similar studies conducted across ponderosa pine dominated post-fire landscapes in the Colorado Front Range, in the Black Hills of South Dakota, in Idaho and Montana, and in New Mexico and Arizona. For our third research objective, examining abiotic or biotic factors that influence conifer regeneration in high severity burn areas, we examined several factors, including field measured variables such as elevation, slope, aspect, um, pre-fire basal area, coarse and fine woody debris, cover, understory vegetation cover, which is a sum of grass forb and shrub cover, and several GIS-derived variables, including precipitation, um, soil productivity and drainage index, and topographic wetness index, as well as solar radiation. And of all of these variables, elevation was identified to be an important explanatory variable for regeneration in high severity burn areas. And the results of our generalized linear mixed model analyses illustrate the elevation was statistically significant for all conifers, ponderosa pine, and Douglas fir. And the elevation increases, seedling densities increase in high severity burn areas. And going back to our regression tree analyses at distances within 50 meters of live trees, elevation was identified as the second most important explanatory variable where um, 8,200 feet in elevation was an important ecological cutoff point determined by the analysis, where elevations greater than 8,200 feet had predicted mean regeneration densities of about 450 and um, 375 stems per acre for conifer and ponderosa pine, respectively. And then at distances within 50 meters from live trees, but at elevations less than or equal to about 8,200 feet, we had predicted mean regeneration densities of 61 and 53 um, stems per acre for conifer and ponderosa pine, respectively. Lower elevations have been shown to pose greater challenges for post-fire regeneration than higher elevations, 
due to higher temperatures, lower precipitation, and higher evaporative demand at lower elevations. So at lower elevations, we have predicted regeneration densities that are unclear whether they'll be sufficient to naturally reforest these burn areas over time, whereas at higher elevations, predicted regeneration densities are quite abundant. So to summarize for the Colorado Front Range re region, our results illustrate that post-fire regeneration is occurring in the high, the high severity burn patches of recent Colorado Front Range fires, but average regeneration densities are low, and it's uncertain whether this regeneration is sufficient for natural forest recovery. The regeneration densities that are occurring in these patches, particularly in areas where surviving forest is not in close proximity, are generally much lower than both the National Forest Manage Management Act and historical benchmarks. The National Forest Management Act dictates that regeneration values of about 150 stems per acre or more are necessary for ponderosa pine dominated forests in this region to be considered minimally stocked to remain in the timber base. Um, and while this might not be the most ecologically appropriate benchmark, Historical stand densities um, might be more appropriate, and in the Colorado Front Range, they averaged about 40 to 60 stems per acre. And so while our findings of 48 stems per acre are within historical stand densities, this value does not reflect the fact that the majority of this regeneration is occurring within 50 meters of forest edges. And of course, this is only a snapshot in time, so the average regeneration densities that we have found does not account for very high natural um, uh, rates of seedling mortality, nor does it account for future seedling recruitment. We also found that distance from live trees is the most important factor influencing post-fire conifer regeneration, and that very little regeneration is occurring greater than 50 meters from surviving forest. Um, elevation is also an important predictor of conifer regeneration in high severity burn areas, where higher elevations are positively correlated with increased conifer regeneration densities and very little rege regeneration has occurred at lower elevations. In 2015, we expanded this study to the larger Southern Rockies region, and we sampled in several other fires in the Laramie Mountain Range in Wyoming, in the Black Hills in South Dakota and Wyoming, and we added some additional transects to the 2002 Hayman Fire in the Colorado Front Range. Similar to all of the fires in the Colorado Front Range, these fires in the Medicine Bow and Black Hills National Forest burned 10 or more years ago and burned greater than um, 2,500 acres. We performed nearly the exact same methods in these fires as we did in the Colorado Front Range fires. And across the entire Southern Rockies region, we located a total of 98 transects in 11 fires for a total of 593 plots within these fires. 98 of these plots were located in low to moderate severity burn areas, and 495 plots were located in high severity burn areas. And we also located 52 plots in unburned areas um, located outside of fire perimeters. For the Southern Rockies region, we also examined conifer and deciduous tree regeneration, and we found that regeneration is dominated by conifers, particularly by ponderosa pine, which accounted for 92% of the regeneration that we found in high severity burn plots, and 70 to, and 87% of regeneration in our unburned and low to moderate severity burn plots, respectively. And our preliminary results for the entire Southern Rockies region indicate that conifers are regenerating in high severity burn areas, but again, similar to the Colorado Front Range, at very low densities in comparison to our unburned and low to moderately burned areas. Um, across the Southern Rockies region, high severity burn plots averaged 48 stems per acre, whereas in our unburned and low to moderate severity burn plots, regeneration was four to nine times higher. And across the region, 70% um, of our high severity plots did not have any regeneration, whereas our unburned and low to moderate severity burn plots had much higher rates of regeneration indicating that regeneration events, of course, have occurred across the region, but that high severity burn areas are not experiencing similar rates of regeneration as in the low to moderate severity or unburned areas. Additionally, our pre preliminary results for the Southern Rockies indicate that distance from surviving forest is influencing conifer regeneration in high severity burn areas. 
And we're seeing similar trends of decreasing density um, of regeneration as distance from surviving forest increases. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Preliminary results also indicate that across the Southern Rockies region, coarse woody debris might also be influencing conifer regeneration in high severity burn areas. Where the relationship between conifer regeneration and coarse woody debris is positive, and that more regeneration is found where cover is higher than where it is lower. So our preliminary results across the Southern Rockies region, as well as what we learned on the Colorado Front Range, indicate that conifer regeneration is occurring in high severity burn areas, but at low density. And the resilience of ponderosa pine dominated forest within the perimeter of large high severity wildfires in the, in the Southern Rockies and across its distribution depends on sufficient post-fire tree regeneration as little to no surviving trees remain. So while regeneration is occurring, the low densities that we're seeing are lower than the National Forest Management Act and historical benchmarks across the entire region. The regeneration that is occurring in these areas will take decades to centuries to reach reproductive maturity, prolonging natural recovery of these forests. However, the densities that we recorded are, of course, only a brief snapshot in time, and they do not account for future regeneration events, nor does it account for naturally high rates of seedling mortality. Distance from surviving forest is an important predictor of where conifer regeneration will likely occur, and that little regeneration is occurring at distances greater than 50 meters from forest edges. This reflects similar findings in other studies across the distribution of ponderosa pine, where ponderosa pine are found to be regenerating within about 200 meters of surviving trees, with little regeneration occurring beyond 200 meters. And this um, photo is a great illustration of sort of this band of regeneration that occurs um, uh, near forest edges, where within about 50 meters of forest edges we see in this case, a really high amount of regeneration, but as you um, move out into the high severity burn area, you see very, very little tree regeneration. So other site factors may also be influencing conifer regeneration across the Southern Rockies region. And our preliminary results indicate that an increase in coarse woody debris cover results in increased rates of regeneration. Um, in the coming weeks and months, we'll be examining additional site factors so stay tuned for some additional findings that we'll have coming, coming shortly. So these findings have some important implications for managers in terms of long-term forest regeneration and resiliency following high severity wildfires. Um, our findings and that of several other studies across the distribution of ponderosa pine indicate that the resiliency of ponderosa pine forests following large high, high severity wildfires is limited by distance to surviving forest um, to, to surviving forest edges. And higher regeneration densities seen in the Southern Rockies region are likely insufficient to return very large high severity burn patches to a forested condition, particularly where surviving forest is not nearby. So as a result, these patches might undergo a conversion to a non-forested area, such as a grassland or shrubland, which may or may not be desirable for land managers and the public. If a forested condition is desired, post-fire planting within high severity burn patches should be aimed at areas where distances is greater than 50 meters from live trees. And without planting in the middle of these high severity burn areas, natural forest regeneration may not occur or take several decades or centuries, as ponderosa pine establishment is limited to areas near surviving trees. Forest recovery may be particularly limited in areas of lower elevation near grasslands where conditions are more xeric. We also recommend that managers continue to implement ecologically appropriate restoration treatments in ponderosa pine dominated forests that might be at an increased risk of uncharacteristically high, high severity wildfire. Um, restoration treatments should aim to create more open and heterogeneous forested conditions by reducing canopy density while also creating stands that are a diverse mixture of openings, individual trees, and tree groups. And restoration treatments in ponderosa pine dominated forests have been shown to moderate fire behavior, even under extreme weather conditions, and may increase the potential for trees to survive within the perimeters of future fires. 
restoration treatments are particularly important because future fires are predicted to become even more severe and more frequent in ponderosa pine forests of the southern Rockies due to climate change, which will create even more challenges to the recovery of severely burned ponderosa pine dominated forests. And so again, the main take home story for this work is that conifer regeneration is occurring in severely burned areas in the southern Rockies, but regeneration densities are low. An increased distance from surviving forests leads to decreased regeneration densities in high severity burn areas, where most regeneration is occurring within 50 meters of forest edges. Other biotic and abiotic factors, such as elevation on the Colorado Front Range and coarse woody debris across the Southern Rockies region, are influencing post-fire regeneration. So with that, that's about all I have for you um, for this webinar, but um, I would love to answer any further questions after this. First, um, I'd like to thank the Southwest Fire Science Consortium, Jose Iniguez, um, uh, and Xander Evans for the invitation and to Xander for hosting this webinar. Um, and to all of those of you who've attended this webinar today for your time and attention. I'd also like to thank all of our field technicians that helped collect this data, particularly Ariana Moore, who is with us for both field, um, field seasons. And I'd like to thank my advisor, Dan Binkley, and my committee member, Jason Seibel, for their support, as well as Steve Alton, Scott Baggett, Ben Bird, and Ben Gannon for providing advice, insights, and support. The City of Fort Collins Natural Areas and Boulder County Open Spaces were kind enough to allow us to collect data on their property. Funding was provided by the National Fire Plan. And my email, um, mchamber at rams.colostate.edu, is provided for any of you who would like to contact me regarding any um, questions. So thank you so much. Well, that was excellent. Thank you, Marin. <coughs> um, we have time for some questions. And uh, Manuel Lucas, uh, I, who I believe is from Spain, uh, has typed in one. I'll go ahead and read that. Do you think planting ponderosa pine trees will be a solution for these places that are located far from the burned area, or far from the unburned area, rather? Um, yes, I think planting within the high severity burn patches further from forest edges will be necessary if a forested condition is desired. Um, just anecdotally, being out in these high severity burn areas, there are very few um, tree seedlings that we saw even just walking around and while there might be some long distance dispersal events, um, I think that without planting in the middle of these high severe burn patches, um, we will not see regeneration occurring within these fires for, for many decades or centuries. And maybe building on Manuel's question, um, I, I don't think this was the point of your sampling strategy, but I wonder if you could be willing to uh, sort of extend it to this area and that is uh, some, some high severity patches have uh, small stringers or a little patch. Do you feel that, say, there's a, I don't know, a couple hundred acre uh, patch of high severity, but somewhere in the middle there's a group of 10 ponderosa pine trees. Do you feel, based on all the time you spent walking around these areas, that you might get a similar sort of 50 meter ring around those individuals or uh, is the, the process different because there's so few compared to say a forest edge where it might be dense forest behind? Yeah, that's a great question and that was something that we were interested in potentially um, examining and just have not come up with the funding for, um, for this work. But what, what you're referring to, I would, um, we've referred to as islands of trees within these high severity patches. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of these within the Buffalo Creek fire image that I have for you. Um, so here there's just a, a, you know, a little stand of trees that you can see that survived. Um, there's a couple more. So these, these stringer of trees, um, in this particular case, this fire um, burned with really high winds and burned from west to east, which is why it has this kind of interesting cigar-shaped fire. And these stringers of trees survived that. And from anecdotally being out in these areas, I would say that you certainly see greater regeneration in areas where there are surviving trees. And obviously, the more trees that there are, um, the more regeneration you'll see occur. 
But really, we did not see as many individual trees or small groups of trees in really high severity burn areas um, that were very large, like particularly in this high severity burn patch in the Hayman Fire. Um, there's very few trees out in this area, and I've spent a fair amount of time in this area, um, and there's some great lookouts that um, I'll just kind of put some little little markers on um, that, that I've been, you know, relatively close to. So you have really great uh, visual of the landscape there, and there's very few single trees that survived. So in some of these patches, I would say it really depends on how large the high severity burn patch is, as well as um, how many surviving trees there are. And in some cases, topography or rocks um, made it so that you know, a single tree or a few trees were able to survive. And in those cases, again, it really depends on how large these high severity burn patches are. But um, the forest edges, we're seeing relatively low densities of regeneration occurring in, high, in these bands along forest edges. And so there's this so, sort of slow creep um, of regeneration that will kind of come into these high severity burn areas. So depending on how large these, these burn areas are, I don't think that we're going to see a lot of um, natural regeneration occurring without planting. Whereas in, um, in patches that are not very large, I think that we will see regeneration occurring. It just might take many decades or centuries. Does that answer that question that you asked, Sander? Yeah, thank you so much. And, and let me turn back to some that have come in in the chat window. Uh, Margaret Horner, I think that's the next one. Yeah, Margaret Horner asks, what other types of vegetation did you find in the high severity patches? Are these species that you would expect and within the natural range of variation successional pathways? Yeah, good question. Um, so in the Colorado Front Range, we saw a lot of what I would call forb-dominated communities that were um, predominantly shrubs such as ribes um, and yucca and a lot of grasses um, and other forbs of that nature. Um, in the Black Hills, in the northern part of the Black Hills, we saw a lot of bur oak and um, paper birch regeneration. And then there was a lot of aspen regeneration across the Southern Rockies region, but I would not say that the aspen regeneration was so much that um, it, you know, it wasn't enough to analyze individually. So I wouldn't say that there was going to be any kind of conversion to a deciduous forested condition. Um, but generally, I would say it's going to be converted to a grassland or shrubland, um, particularly on the Colorado Front Range that's a little bit more forb dominated than it was um, in the, the uh, Laramie Mountains and in the Black Hills. Um, and, and then for the second part of your question, um, whether these species are what I expected and within the natural range of variation or successional pathways, um, yeah, I, I suspected that, um, that these areas, you know, in areas not close to forest edges were likely going to be converted at least for a period of time to some kind of grass or shrubland. Um, and as far as the the natural range of variation in the successional pathways, um, you know, that's really hard to, to answer because I think that there's a lot of um, thought that these are outside of a natural range of variation where um, I'm just going to kind of circle another patch here in this image in the Hayman Fire. Um, you know, and in, this is quite a large high severity burn patch once you're inside of it. But this burn patch, I don't worry about regenerating quite as much as I worry about um, much larger high severity burn patches, such as this larger burn area that we're seeing here. Um, does that answer your question, Margaret? I don't yeah, know Margaret, you can go ahead and, and type in. Uh, yes, OK, good. Um, <clears throat> and uh, let's see. So another question came in from. Um, Tim Horst that uh, asks, how mature do the seedlings have to be, i.e., how long do they have to grow before they become the new effective forest edge? So I guess this gets to the idea of, well, if uh, we have this 50-meter band that, that may be regenerating fairly well, uh, how long before that 50 meters can then contribute to the next, uh, the next band of 50 meters? How, 
and maybe it's uh, maturity to cone crop? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's not actually a lot of literature or research that has examined how long it takes ponderosa pine to reach reproductive maturity. Um, there's some anecdotal evidence as well as um, just a study, I believe it's from the 1930s, that suggests that ponderosa pine um, reaches reproductive maturity at 60 years. But to my memory, that is in um, not in the Colorado Front Range or in the Southern Rockies. It's in a, um, a more mesic area where um, uh, trees grow taller and larger and likely reach reproductive maturity earlier than they will in areas like the Southern Rockies where conditions are a bit more xeric and we um, have higher altitudes potentially. Um, so we, we have sort of thought that um, it might be between 60 to 100 years here in the Southern Rockies. Um, but again, we really don't have any research that, that can prove that. Um, but uh, one of my co-authors, Sparkle Malone, who I don't know if she's on um, this webinar or not, but um, she has developed an interesting map, a predictive map, looking at um, this same question and how long it might take for forested areas to regenerate, given that um, this band of 50 meters from forest edges um, will reach reproductive um, maturity in 60 to 100 years. And again, in some cases, um, you know, in smaller high severity burn patches, um, it does take decades to centuries for it to kind of fill in. Whereas in the case of this particular patch that we're looking at in the, in the Hayman fire, um, I believe it took um, centuries, many centuries, um, to fill in this, this area to become a forested area again. But yeah, great question. And, and uh, Jose Iniguez Pepe's question sort of builds uh, on this same issue from a slightly different perspective. Um, so he's asking, are these regeneration densities a rate so that over time we would expect to see, say, four seedlings per decade at the 250 meters away from the forest edge, which would then in turn mean that after a century we might have, uh, I think, I think it would be 40 trees per uh, acre. Um, so I, I guess the, the question is, would we see a similar buildup of the long distance dispersal to complement the maybe wave uh, of uh, maturing forest edge? Yeah, um, Jose and I have had some interesting conversations about this question. and. Um, you know, his, excellent, his question is excellent. Um, yeah, potentially over time we would expect to see um, what we're considering to be within these kind of historical benchmarks and that in potentially in a century we might have the kind of forested conditions we're looking for, which are more open and heterogeneous, have, um, have you know, both individual trees and groups of trees um, based upon these kinds of patterns of <clears throat> excuse me, um, dispersal from forest edges. Um, but there's, there's, some, there's some definitely a point there with that. And then there's also the question of what um, climate change might do. Um, we also don't know once these areas, particularly very large high severity burn areas, may or may not have converted to a non-forested condition, they're, there might be such strong competition from understory um, vegetation and shrubs to, um, to compete with ponderosa pine seeds that might actually land out in these high severity burden areas. So we're, we're really not sure, and that's a really good question that I think really time will tell. Um, yeah. Great, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, are there other questions? Uh, sounds like Manuel found the, the presentation useful, even um, for his research in Spain, so that's nice to hear. Awesome. Uh, and maybe while people are typing other questions, I have a, a question of a different kind for the participants, although, um, Marin, I'd like you to weigh in on this as well. We were just talking on a Southwest Fire Science Consortium planning call about whether this, this general topic of uh, post-fire regeneration and conditions in 
um, hot, large, high severity fires is a topic that is ripe for a sort of synthesis or review. So I wonder if people could uh, put in in their feedback window, yes or no, based on whether you feel there's been enough published or whether you feel like, oh, maybe there's new studies like Marin, your second study um, that uh, is on its way to being published. Maybe we should wait a year. Um, and so a no vote would be wait uh, because more data is coming out. I'd be very interested to know uh, what, what people on this call is, as people interested in the topic felt. And so far it looks like the answer is split. So definitely go in and, and vote if you have an opinion on whether the topic of post-fire regeneration would be a worthwhile synthesis effort for the consortium based on Marin and, and many other people's work. And while we're waiting on that, okay, so April Smith says, wait, more research coming out in, in one to two years. Good, okay, useful to know. And uh, it may be that it requires more than, maybe it's a topic we revisit as well. Other questions from the participants? Well, Marin, I think, oh, um, so uh, Pepe also asks, how much variation was there between the sites? So <clears throat> a lot of what you've been presenting are sort of the, the summary statistics, which gives us a nice overview, but maybe either from the statistics or your own marching through these areas, Marin, do you feel like there was a lot of variation, or do you feel like these summary statistics capture the, the variation fairly well? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I actually found a lot of variability between these, um, these fires as well as our site particularly. Um, so within fires, we also had a lot of variability, and a lot of that really, in my opinion, depended upon elevation. Um, but yeah, there's a, there was a lot of variability. We actually found um, the highest regeneration rates in the Colorado Front Range on, in the Hayman Fire, which was quite surprising to me. But a lot of that fire is at higher elevation, um, elevations above that sort of 8,200-foot um, cutoff point that, uh, that we determined was important. Um, and then in the Black Hills, there was also a lot of variation in conifer regeneration. And the northern part of the Black Hills, some of the fires that we worked in there, let me see if I can scroll back to um, some of these five, the, the maps. Some of the fires that we looked at in the northern part of the, um, the Black Hills had a lot of conifer regeneration, whereas the Jasper Fire, particularly in the Roger Shack Fire, which were two very large fires in the, the southern portion of the Black Hills, didn't have quite as much regeneration. And um, I really think that this was, again, due to that sort of mesic versus xeric-ness of, um, of the elevational gradient. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of variability across the fires as well as within the fires. Um, so it, it was very interesting to see that. Great, thank you. And um, maybe I think we may have exhausted our questions, so I think I'll, I'll thank you again, Marin, for a great presentation. I appreciate you going into detail on the methods because it makes a big difference for how we, we think about these problems, how we study them. Um, and also the, the, the summary results, uh, I think, confirm things that I've seen on like the Lost Conscious Fire down here, but it's nice to have someone who actually has the numbers to back it up. So I, I really appreciate you uh, doing the research and presenting it. And thanks Great. for all our Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and close it down now and hope to see many of you on future webinars.